talk is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be about speech, about babies, about communities. So, and uh, these are my colleagues, Barbara Davies. Um, she, together with Peter McMillan, uh, work on the origin of the speech. She has, she, they have the French content theory of the speech. And Ian, she's a bright property student. And so this is uh, our team work. The first thing that uh, we would like to explain is that timing is central to speech. Um, speech takes place a long time. This is something that we have, uh, uh, is a characteristic of the speech. And um, the, the basics of the speech is that there are two components, the articulatory component and the phonatory component. In the phonatory component, we can use a sound, a sound wave. The sound wave travels to the oral cavity, and there we modify the shape of the oral cavity with our tongue, lips, jaw, movement of the jaw. And then this um, behaves like a set of uh, filters that modify the amplitude of the sound wave that we produced in the phonatory component. And with this sketch, we can relate then oral cavity to um, the production of consonants and vowels, and the larynx to the production of pitch which changes the melody of a sentence. To give you an example, if I say Mary's tummy or Mary's tummy, we have the same sounds that are produced in a similar manner in the oral cavity, but we are changing the pitch, we are changing the intonation that comes from the phonatory component. And uh, when we see all this system, we see that timing is central, that the coordination of all the activities of the larynx and the jaw and the tongue and all the muscles are essential to produce intelligible speech. When timing is not right, the speech is not intelligible. So, but the language is better than words. So I'm gonna show you this movie and the tool that illustrates the movement of the jaw coordinated with uh, lips and tongue and the video. place in the articulatory component. Here in the phonatory component, we change speech in a, and the, the pitch changes take place within the syllable. For example, if I say Mary, like a, like a question, uh, here you will see, oh, this is uh, pitch. So you will see a uh, rising pitch that starts always on the second syllable. It doesn't matter how much, how many times I say this word, we always have the same pattern. This rising starts in the second syllable. And the same, now if I have a descendant tone, it, it, these movements, these speech movements coordinate with the syllable. An easier way to see uh, the coordination of speech movements within the syllable is with ton tonal languages, especially, for example, Mandarin Chinese tones. It has four tones. We have a falling tone, a level tone, a raising tone, and a dipping tone. And when we put these tones, these intonation on, on the syllable ma, we can have four different words, four different meanings. So now that we see that timing is important for the speech and the functions of the different components, let's ask ourselves this question. How do communities acquire the fine timing control required to produce the speech? And we are going to start with the idea that, the, uh, that there are some existing mechanisms that are adapted for new purposes. For example, we had the vocal tract used for eating, the respiratory system for breathing, and we are going to adapt these systems to produce a new output, speech. We can think that this problem is faced by babies and it is faced by communities in the same, in, in analogous ways. And uh, this idea then um, allows us to think that the speech development retraces, at least to some degree, the steps of its evolution. And we are going to see um, speech development in babies like a short time window of the speech in, in evolution. But what we are going to focus on is in the motor constraints. So we are going to study the motor constraints that underlie the speech timing patterns in babies, babbling, children, 
across, across the languages. And the thing that, since uh, they shape the speech of all these populations, may as well have shaped the speech of hominids. So let's talk to, uh, the talk of mine. We are going to see how the frame content theory approach by Davies of image and it uh, explains um, how motor constraints shape the speech in the oral cavity, and this is the frame content approach. Then we are going to find out what do we know about motor constraints in the functory component, and we are going to see uh, how it has been studied in adults, and we are going to see work by Shu and Sun in children, work by Yan and colleagues, and then we are going to explore uh, how it works in prelinguistic babies. Eight months old babies that they don't talk yet, but they, they bother. And it is going to be our contribution. And then we are going to relate the motor constraints and the planetary component with the frame content approach. So, what is the frame content theory? There is a dichotomy between frames and concepts. And now I will keep my hand. Okay. Um, Think of frame as the movement of the jaw. So the frame is the uh, is the movement of the jaw, and the content uh, are, is the movement that relates to segmenting the structure. So while we are moving the jaw, we coordinate the movement of the jaw with the moving of the, the movement of the tongue, and this movement of the tongue will relate to content. And the central idea is that the the, the serial constant vowel alternations emerge from these alternations, from the upper and close alternations of the, of the, of the job. Um, let me explain this in more detail. For example, um, the speech in babies. You know that babies start making sounds. And the first thing that they learn that makes these speech sounds more, more speech-like is rhythmicity. Now they start making sounds. They start playing, and they scream, they scream, they cry, or they do sounds like that they don't have rhythmicity. But all of a sudden, they transfer this movement that they use in eating, in eating that together with clinicians, to have um, some kind of syllables. These syllables are produced only with this movement while the tongue is in a static position. And this position can be, you know, lying there, or in a, in a advanced position, or in a retracted position, but it's a static during all the time that the jaw, the jaw is moving, moving. So there is no independent control of jaw movement and tongue movement. Um, there is control of how far the jaw is being moved. No? So if we do a big cycle and then a small cycle, there is control of that. So this control on the opening and, um, and closing uh, movement of the, of the jaw, plus the rhythmicity, plus this static uh, position of the tongue within the jaw, uh, produce a, a set of small syllables. And this is what uh, babies have when they babble. They are in the frame stage. And then they add content. So when uh, they need to communicate more, um, they need to increase this number of syllables. And the way, the most efficient way to do that is by, you know, they keep on doing this with the movement, that they coordinate in an independent way the movement of the jaw with the movement, movement of the and those are the stages of development in children, in babies. And we can see that these two stages of development can also apply to hominids. For example, first they had the frame. So the rhythmic jaw movements used in activities like eating were transferred to speech. And the first the speech act consisted of rhythmic jaw movements without independent tongue control, which yields a small subset of different syllables. And then they had the, they added the content, so for communication purposes, Serial complexity of utterances had to increase, and they achieved this increment, increment by adding some top movement to the open closed jaw cycles as a consequence of cell organization and biomechanical constraints. So, this is how you know, the, the, the coordination in this part in the articulatory component is explained by the frame content theory. And now, uh, you see, the frame content theory doesn't explain anything about this. And this is what we are going to study. How does it work in adults? How, does, how it works in linguistic children? How it works with prelinguistic children? And then when we have an idea of uh, how it works, let's see how it goes together with this uh, frame theory. 
So what do we know about the pitch component, the planetary component in atoms? The first thing, the, the first thing is that pitch movements are coordinated with the CO. And we already saw examples from English, not very, very, or from the four tones in Mandarin Chinese. But there is more to it. There are other things. For example, there is a limit on how fast the speaker can change pitch in a voluntary manner. And this has been studied by Xu and colleagues. And it has been termed uh, minimal movement duration. And it has been studied in um, uh, Mandarin Chinese speakers, English speakers, so uh, speakers from tonal and non-tonal languages, and it's the same across languages. And uh, it's explained by two linear functions. And uh, you see that to do the same um, change in sending tones, uh, rising tones take more time than falling tones. And then another big finding by uh, Shu and Sam is that this minimal movement duration is often approached in normal speech. And um, therefore, physiological constraints play an important role in shaping pitch in adults. Usually, you know, speech has been thought as a trade off between economy and production. So you, you don't make, um, you only make the necessary effort in articulation to be understood perceptually. So they, it has not been thought that you really, um, that physiological constraints play an important role. That this uh, indicates the contrary. So what we have is a minimal movement duration that is down to the zero. And what it, uh, what it means is that it limits the freedom of using time information for information flowing, leaving duration as the only aspect of the speaker's kind of control. So an example of that. Imagine that we have two syllables, but they are uh, run in a certain amount of time, and we have a falling pitch in syllable one. But we want to do a raising pitch in syllable two. If these two syllables have the same time, we can only raise pitch so far. If we want to reach the target, the only thing we can do is to increase the length of the syllable. And now imagine that we want to produce a pitch that is um, as like two targets. Then it means that we have to even increase the syllable more because we have two movements. So there is a continuum. You know? Falling tones can be done in shorter syllables, raising tones in larger, longer syllables, and dipping tones in even larger syllables. So that's that we know of pitch in atoms and how does the pitch mechanism work. But how does it work in children? Young, Neil, and Davis had a five years old, eight years old, and 12 years old monolingual speaker of Chinese. Um, they showed them pictures, and they had to say the words. And they found that you know, the, the, the syllables in falling tones were shorter, and the rising level tones were longer, and in dipping tones, they were longer. But the overall duration and the variability patterns in children were much larger than in adults. So what it means is that there is some common underlying mechanism that children still have to control it. It's like uh, they show that maturation of laryngeal control develops over time. So that's why we know how pitch works in, in, the, in the children and in adults. But how does it work in the realistic state? How does it work for babies that bubble? They don't have the intention to say words. They just, uh, when you bubble, you know, you bubble the same in all along, in, in all languages, there are no big differences. Uh, it's, like a, uh, um, it's like a recurve of motor control when you bubble. And so how does it work uh, at eight months old? Uh, the two questions is how does the mechanic of pitch works these uh, eight month old babies, and if there is any relation between um, production here in the articulatory control with production here in the planetary uh, component. We have four eight month old babies, two Chinese, uh, primary learning, and two English, recordings for their spontaneous vocalizations, and we have the, the more than 800 utterances. For each syllable, Canonical, non-canonical, like we give examples of what canonical and non-canonical means, we measure dispersion size, dispersion time, and dispersion speed. Let me show you some examples. Here we have a syllable with a tone, so let me see if you can hear it. Here you have a call, here 
Here you have a falling zone, so the pitch dispersion would be the difference between the maximum and the minimum from the negative <coughs> arrow, and the dispersion time, the time it takes. But then we have syllables that have more complex zones. So here we have, you know, uh, each uh, dispersion size would be from here to here, and then from here to here, and then dispersion time. And this is a more complex zone. We also measure syllable duration and then syllable complexity, uh, syllable type, canonical and non canonical, the number of syllables in an utterance. We also measure and classify um, um, syllables by pitch change if there is only one direction falling or raising with there are two directions, well, like dipping and dips. So let me give you some examples. Canonical and non canonical refers to rhythmicity. Remember that we said that. Uh, the first thing that they acquired to be speech like in Mavic is this rhythmicity. So here you have a seven syllable utterance, and all the syllables are canonical because they have this rhythmicity. They have this movement of opening and closing the jaw is quite regular. You see very nice changes in pitch. Um, Syllables where they are not canonical, you don't see this regularity that the jaw doesn't move. There are sounds like a smack in the tongue or things like mm -hmm. or ah, no? But it also has to do with time. No, there is not this rhythmicity of moving the jaw. So here you will have three syllables that are canonical and one that is not. You know that it means canonical or non canonical now. So, results minimal movement duration. How does it work for these babies? So, those are the regressions of the falling tones and the raising tones. The falling tones are red lines, the raising tones, green lines. And we see that for doing the same movement, the expression time, for example, if you want to move five semitones, it takes much longer for rising tones than for falling tones. And this happens in babies, but when we compare our data with shoes data, we see that it's very similar. Shoes data is the dotted lines, and, and, and ours is the solid lines. So what we see is that really uh, the same pattern, you know, that uh, falling tones, to do the same movement in semitones, it's faster in falling tones than in raising tones. We also have expression of the speed. Uh, this is in babies. We have um, the regression for each baby for the falling tones in green and the raising tones in, in red. And what we observe is that with, um, with, uh, when we um, increase the semitones, when we increase here the explosion size, four semitones, seven semitones, 12 semitones, we also increase the speed. And this happens for falling tones, raising tones, and it happens for babies and adults. So, eight-month-old babies show the same biomechanical constraints as adults, not different in home. And here we have um, syllable type. Here we measure syllables that they have this uh, complex tone or dipping tones, and here falling or rising tones, and you will see that uh, almost for all babies there is a difference uh, saying that falling and raising are uh, shorter than dipping and convex tones. But observe that less than 10% of eight month old babies' productions are syllables with a uh, complex tone or a dipping tone. In fact, the rising falling, falling shape is more frequent than the falling raising. Even that in, in, in Chinese babies, even in Chinese babies, where only the falling raising shape constitutes a Chinese tone. So this is an evidence that we are not really copying from the language at this point. It's just a matter of motor control. So the same kind of mechanical constraints shape each production in mammals, shape each production in eight month old babies. So the other question was if there is any relation between developing motor control here and the dynamic in the articulatory components, when we were comparing canonical syllables to non-canonical syllables, we were comparing them in terms of if uh, some had more falling tones or raising, no, they have the same patterns. We think they acquired first falling tones, 
then I they add uh, rising zones, and then they add these uh, rising falling zones. And the same, uh, they don't change uh, this canonical and non-canonical syllable when they for its worth of time or speed. So basically, there is no relation between development of motor control here and development of motor control here at eight months long days. So conclusions, what can we say? We say that uh, from seven months old, from starting from seven months old until 12 months old, babies are in the frame stage. They have this rhythmic movement of the jump. They control um, the size of the jump movement. And they have a stack. They have uh, static front positions, and with these, they start with a restricted uh, set of syllables. And at this time, at, the, at this time, they control very well this movement and the timing of this movement and the size of this movement. And we have seen that this is the only thing that you need to control or to be able to realize in an intelligible manner uh, different kinds of speech. So, at the same time that they have this restricted set of syllables, they also have all kinds of tones. They have falling, rising, complex, and deeping. And then at one point, they start using their first words. It's not only rehearsal of motor control, but they try to communicate something. When they try to communicate something, they are not copying at the beginning from the ambient language. They are just transferring what they have to the patterns of the ambient language. So they have this small set of syllables, and they have some control over, you know, from different tones. But when uh, they, they, they have to add meaning, some of the um, routines that they had acquired to do, for example, uh, some tones, um, they even use it because of this increase of uh, processing load that adding meaning means. So they restrict the number of uh, syllables and tones that they used in their first words. But then uh, the pressure to communicate increases, they need more words, and then they start copying the, the ambient language. And then when they have to increase uh, words and they have to copy the ambient language, they have to add content to this frame. So they have to start moving the song in an independent mo manner than, the, than they will the show. And uh, they, we can think of this, that this, this sequence somehow can apply also to Hominid. We can think that Hominid started also moving the jaw without moving the song. And we saw that this movement of the jaw is the only thing that we need to have monetary control. So um, the first words of Huminis, you know, at the reduced syllable set plus monetary control. Then Huminis didn't have a very complex system. Uh, uh, they, don't, uh, they, they have to create a language. So um, the thing that babies copy from the Andean language is cannot apply, this analogy cannot apply that well. But they also have a need to increase the vocabulary. And this triggers the function of the stage. But they have a creative use of available resources to make that work. And, uh, you know, they already have monetary control and they start having this control of the tone. So, what means is that there is a possibility in having a trade off between, for example, if you create words by using tones like in Mandarin Chinese, maybe you don't need to develop uh, a set of syllables that is as large as in English, for example, that doesn't have tones, but has many more uh, syllables than, than uh, Mandarin Chinese has. So there is this possibility of this trade-off. As you can see, those are only descriptions of, um, of mechanisms uh, and of timing and uh, how they develop. But um, the one thing about the speech is that even though the timing is central, it's not very well understood. And uh, this is one, uh, you know, uh, studying um, timing in these two components and how it develops and really understand it well mm, to understand you know, speech development and also to understand maybe um, speech development.